thank you uh, good evening everyone um, hello wildlife uh, hope you are all doing fine um, it's a great day to have this session today uh, just to briefly tell you about our wildlife uh, wildlifers group we are members of uh, we are called the rotary fellowship of wildlifers for conservation we share a common interest that is wildlife and its conservation uh, we're willing to work with 118 year old organization rotary towards building a future in which people and nature thrive we are a group of over 500 plus interested individuals who have globally united around a common interest with the primary purpose of networking and further friendship our uh, purpose is to create awareness about importance of wildlife to promote lasting friendships outside of one's own rotary club district and also country and to promote locally regionally and globally that uh, conservation of uh, living resources are important to humans and future generations to enjoy our world and the incredible species that uh, live within it um today we have uh, invited members of rotary and friends uh, from different areas for this meeting uh, over to you rajiv you can formally welcome them all yes rajiv yeah yeah i'm here i'm here i'm here yes okay. so, hello everyone so we really have uh, members you know joining us from across the globe so uh, i would like to start by you know welcoming them by greeting them with a good morning good afternoon and uh, good evening with respective uh, you know countries or you know, places wherever you are a warm warm welcome to each and every one of you and thank you for joining us today it's a very uh, you know i would say uh, a session that we've been waiting for it's very uh, important as uh, we have uh, quite a lot of uh, you know sneak bites uh, that you know we uh, come across or you know we we'll listen to from uh, different sources so the session is uh, you know snakes and snake bites in india by uh, jerry martin one of the most popular herpetologists and conservationists i'm sure all of us are eager to listen to him jerry may also request you to kindly speak a little about your uh, beautiful farm uh, that you've named uh, the martin farm too thank you uh, with that further ado uh, let's quickly go to the ch our chairman uh, rin sanjay krishna and then to the speaker himself over to you sanjay sanjay we can't hear you thank you all right yeah a very warm welcome to you uh, uh, once again on behalf of wild lifers i extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker of the day mr jerry <coughs> martin mr jerry martin has been working with reptiles and other wildlife for over 20 years now he was india's first natural uh, national geographic channel advice adventurer and has been featured in numerous television shows he was part of the team that first bred and successfully raised king cobras in captivity in india and has worked with a vast variety of other reptiles and amphibians today his focus is uh, tackling the snake bite crisis in india and developing platforms by which local stakeholders can gain from and support conservation in their localities thank you so much jerry please over to you can you take over from thank you so much uh, sanjay and rajiv um, so uh, good evening everyone well uh, like rajiv said good evening morning night uh, afternoon um, i figured we could jump straight into it um, i have one request though if any of you can keep your videos on that would be great i'm i'm still not accustomed to the talking to the screen thing so uh, i'm going to just share my screen because i've got a presentation and uh, we can take it from there uh, through the entire uh, the, the entire time that we are actually doing this uh, please feel free to you know stop me at any time uh, if you need to Uh, if you need to ask a question or have a comment, Jerry, or... Jerry, could we uh, could could we reserve the question and answers for the end? Is it okay? Uh, uh, sure. We, we will, we will okay. request 
we will request members to type in their questions in the chat box. Probably okay. we can uh, uh, take it up at the end of the conversation so that. Uh, sure. Whichever works for you. All right. Thanks, thanks. Okay. Great. So we're going to talk about snakes and snake bite, uh, specifically in India, because India is, uh, uh, is quite, well, I would like to say just unique, but unfortunately it's, it's, uh, it's one of the worst hit as far as snake bite and the casualties go. Um, but we're also very blessed because we have amongst the highest diversity of snakes and that diversity um, is, is growing uh, rapidly every week. We're, we're finding new species, new species are being described. Um, and in a short while, India well, it already is, but in a short while, India will be quite um, well, untouchable as far as um, the number of snake species we've got. But to start at the very basics, uh, we can look, snakes are basically reptiles. So reptiles are, are cold-blooded animals that uh, uh, they need to, they need to uh, regulate their own body temperature by finding spaces uh, with different temperature. Uh, snakes don't have eyelids. They only have sort of like a swimming goggle. It's part of their skin. It's a clear scale called the brill. And they don't have ears open to the outside. So... Um, Although there is some research going on at present uh, looking at how, what frequencies of airborne sounds snakes can hear. By and large, they can't hear airborne sounds. They can feel vibrations because like us, they have a, uh, an eardrum that's attached to their lower draw, jaw. And if the jaw is against a, a substrate, they are able to feel vibrations quite well. Um, ectothermic is, means that they need, to, uh, they need the surroundings to dictate their temperature. Uh, and they have a watertight skin, um, it, unlike amphibians, unlike frogs, which, which either breathe through or even allow water to, to pass through the skin. Uh, snakes and all reptiles have an, an absolutely watertight skin. And the last bit is sort of like a minor detail, but uh, it's also because one of the things that we see a lot of when we see a snake is them flicking their tongue. And there are some myths that revolve around that. But I'm just going to show you this video. This is super super high speed uh, uh, video of uh, a crate, a common Indian crate actually using its tongue to, to basically taste its environment. And uh, what they do is they, their tongues are slightly sticky and they're able to, uh, to, to touch or, or grab um, particles from the air or substrates in front of them. And those, those particles then get transferred to an organ called the Jacobson's organ, it's also called the vomero nasal organ, and that is like a super sensitive um, taste bud, and they're able to, to really identify smells very, very well. Uh, you might have seen a horse or a cow uh, or even a goat or a dog sometimes facing the wind, and then they lift their upper lip up and they'll take a deep breath in. That's because they're trying to get the air to hit the uh, vomero nasal organ so that they can identify smells. And that's how they're able to even tell things like, um, you know, pheromones and stuff that we can't smell. Snakes can even basically smell uh, pure water. So uh, with, with the Jacobson's organ. Now in India, we have, well, uh, about from last week, we were at 341 species. And uh, I know of at least four or five more that are going to be described in the next uh, month or so. So there's going to be a lot of species, a lot of very fresh herpetological research that's being done, taxonomic research. So people are, we're finding that there's a lot of other species than we knew. Uh, so we're finding species that were never known before. We're also within a certain species, sort of breaking it up into more than one species. So, um, so because of that, the number of species is growing tremendously. Uh, but in places like the Northeast and the Andamans and even the Western Ghats, uh, there are new species that are being found and discovered and, and described. But out of these almost 350 species, only about 50 to 60 of them are what we call significantly venomous. Now, there's a lot of venomous snakes whose venom doesn't affect us at all. So, for example, the vine snake, I'll show you some pictures in a while, or the checkered keelback water snake. They are venomous uh, snakes, but their venom doesn't affect us in the least. Uh, the venom is very targeted towards their prey. And for vine snakes, it's, you know, small amphibians 
or or lizards or or birds for the checkered keelback it's mostly fish so the, the venom is very targeted towards those prey types but there are about 17 actually species uh, that are what we call medically significant which means one they significantly venomous to humans they can do damage or cause death and two they actually do that so for example there are many sea snakes whose venom is so incredibly toxic that if we were to inject ourselves with that uh, venom we'd almost certainly die but these snakes never bite anyone there's hardly any known uh, deaths uh, uh, from these things so they're not uh, seen to be medically significant also one thing that we should know is that there are some species that we call weed species or commensal species like pigeons and sparrows and crows that do very well around humans. And those snakes are uh, like, the, like the cobra, the rat snake, uh, even the checkered keelback and a few other species are very, very well adapted to living with humans. And there are far more of them around us than there are in pristine habitats. So what we'll do over the next... Um, few slides is look at some uh, some snakes. And most of these are, are mostly relevant to Bangalore uh, and some other parts of, of India, but not so much for folks who are from outside the country. But these four species are called the big four. They've been, um, they were believed to be the only ones responsible for, uh, for venomous snake bite in the country. Uh, but since we've now found that there's a lot of other species, in fact, there are huge areas of the country where none of these four species occur, where there is still a fair amount of uh, venomous snake bite, uh, death and, and uh, disability. For example, the northeast of India or the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, they don't have any of these species. But the one on the top left is called the Russell's viper. It's a relatively large viper and it grows to about six feet. Uh, but generally you just see them to be about four to maybe five feet. Um, this is arguably the snake that's responsible for the most amount of death and disability in the world. Um, it's a very, very well camouflaged snake, even though when you look at a picture like this, it looks so stark when it's, when you see it in its, in its natural habitat in, you know, in vegetation or leaf litter, it really blends in very well. And it's exceedingly common, um, in agricultural areas, especially around rice fields. So, um, so and unfortunately, it's involved in a lot of snake bite. The one on the right is the spectacle cobra. Everyone has seen that and we know what it looks like. Uh, it's a snake that has, has basically adopted humans uh, because we make everything really, really great for it. Uh, they, they live very well in sewers and stormwater drains. They enjoy all the rats that come for our waste. And they pretty much enjoy the filth around human habitation. Um, the one on the bottom left is a saw scale viper. It's a tiny snake growing to just about, I mean, a 15 inch or a 16 inch saw scale viper from South India would be a giant. Uh, so they're very small. But again, um, they're involved in a lot of bites. Not so many deaths in, the, in, the, in India. Related species in Africa and the Middle East uh, uh, are involved in a lot of snake bite and snake bite deaths. And then one, the one on the bottom right is a common Indian crate. Um, it was thought to have this, the strongest venom uh, of all the land snakes in, in India. And it was largely true until recently uh, we got, uh, we managed to sample the venom of a Sindh crate um, from, uh, from Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh and from Karnataka. And we found that the, the sin crate has a far more toxic venom uh, and it could well be a big problem uh, as far as snake bite goes. But because they look so similar, uh, people have just been calling it a common crate for the longest time. These are pit vipers um, and you'll see them. So the one on the left is the bamboo pit viper and you'll find it right outside Bangalore, not in, not, not in the heart of it, but Banargata and that rocky belt, uh, Magadi, Banargata, uh, Tumkur, uh, you find them there as well. Uh, they are venomous and they do cause, I mean, they can cause a little tissue damage, but nothing too serious. The one on the top right is the Malabar pit viper. It's involved in a lot of uh, bites for, uh, with um, coffee and tea pickers. Um, still no deaths recorded, but a combination of its venom, which, which destroys cells, 
and the first day that we we use um well causes a lot of local damage but the one at the bottom right is the hump nosed pit viper and that's the species that first blew open this entire big four thing um so in kerala there was a there was a hospital that was reporting a lot of kidney failure from what they were calling saw scale viper bites and it was very strange because saw scale vipers were not known to cause kidney failure anywhere else so at one point the herpetologist went to the hospital and they had they had actually preserved uh, some of the snakes that people that uh, snake bite patients had brought in and we found that this was actually um, a hump nose pit viper and not a saw scale viper so um, and since then there have been a lot of reports a lot of uh, data uh, of a lot of people that have been bitten including some people who have died so it's found in the western ghats and the lower reaches um, and in the coastal uh, kerala and karnataka as well so it's a, and it's a problem because it's very well camouflaged it doesn't move much and people who are either cutting grass or collecting leaves uh, or walking barefoot um, are particularly susceptible to this uh, to a bite from this snake it's again a very small snake Now, like I mentioned, the vine snake. Um, unfortunately, this poor vine snake has got a whole lot of bad press. Um, for one, people believe that that pointed nose is used to drill a hole in your head or scoop your eyes out. Or uh, some some people. I've even heard the story where people talk about how it shoots itself like an arrow at you. Um, none of these are true. In fact, if you try to even scoop your eyes out. it would break its nose because its nose is so fragile and delicate um but if you can see the can you see my cursor yeah. no can you see it the yes. cursor yeah so you see this ridge along the eyes here just in front of the eyes so there's that happens on both sides and you can see the the pupils are very strange they they're sort of horizontal rather than vertical or round which are the common ones otherwise the pupils are, are sort of aligned along that ridge and it's it, it, what ha what happens is the snake uh, is is able to have one image rather than two separate images and having one image is sort of like us where we have binocular vision and that helps it to aim as well as judge distance much better so it's it's a truly wonderful adaptation but it's got nothing to do with us most in fact almost all snakes have evolved devoid of humans so it's not it's not for us that they have things so we should actually first realize that that most of wildlife isn't about us it's about other ecological and evolutionary um uh dynamics that are involved in those things the the vine snake is also a venomous snake but its venom doesn't affect us at all i've heard some uh, reports now and then where people have gotten bitten very badly by a very large a snake and it's itch them for a while but nothing more than that um the one on the top right is a common cat snake also a rear fanged venomous species that doesn't affect us uh, whose bite doesn't affect us at all it's called a cat snake because of those beautiful cat like eyes actually and then below it is a bronze back tree snake that uh, when i was in school used to be incredibly common around bangalore because we had so many gardens it actually it, it needs vegetation to survive it's a very good tree climber uh completely harmless uh and very fast but uh, you don't see many of them in uh, around bangalore anymore so all these are wolf snakes uh because of the bans they are they killed on site in many places because people think that uh, they are crates and they're venomous uh in fact the uh the word in kannada for the crate is kattahavu which is which means sort of when they say cut cut is like lines on the snake so every snake that has bands unfortunately is uh is killed because they think it's it's venomous the wolf snakes are actually incredibly interesting they 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 fundamentally feed on geckos and most geckos can escape predators by either dropping their tail or allowing their their skin to to tear um but um the the wolf snakes are called wolf snakes because they have large teeth in front of their mouths sort of like the canines of a wolf or a dog and they're able to grip geckos with with those teeth but they're completely non venomous 
the banded kukri also one that used to be hardly ever seen but very common uh, around bangalore because of the gardens and the the amount of well earth we had this snake is is quite a is very fond of burrowing uh, and it'll eat the eggs of other of reptiles um uh, and it'll also eat some other small uh, re reptiles like skinks and things like that uh, actually uh, this is called a banded kukri snake there is a related species in Taiwan, uh, which is the only snake known to actually fight to protect a resource. Uh, so when when a, when one of these Taiwanese kukris finds, say, a turtle egg uh, a nest, it will eat some of it, but then it will guard that nest against other kukris and fight them off. Uh, no other snake is known to actually do that. Other snakes are all opportunistic and um they, we haven't we haven't had any reports of any other snake that will guard a resource or a place the only you can see here the, the one on the picture on the left is two male rat snakes doing a male combat ritual where they're actually fighting for the right to mate with a female and a lot of other snakes do that as well uh rat snakes do it king cobras do it um russell's vipers will will combat even even little kukri snakes We've also seen them combat for the right to mate, um, but um, but the kukri snake that I mentioned in Taiwan is the only one known to actually protect a resource. This rat snake is still very very common. Uh, human habitation, um, agricultural landscapes, they just absolutely love it. They, it will eat anything that it can overcome, including other venomous snakes. Uh, it, it eats frogs, um, invertebrates, birds fish, um, amphibians, lizards, uh, rodents. It's a great snake to have around because it's completely harmless. It's also it's one of our largest snakes growing to over 10 feet. Um, and of course, some people believe that it's the, some people believe that it's the male of the cobra and some people believe that it's the female of the cobra. It's actually it's independent species and uh, um, it's a great snake to have around. So if ever there is a, a rat snake in, you know, in your home or community or anything, the best thing to do is just leave it be. It's, uh, it's, when they say snakes are useful to us, this is the epitome of that. Now, all these are actually rear fanged venomous snakes. Uh, they're all keelbacks uh, and they live in different degrees of wetness. Uh, the one on the bottom left is a checkered keelback water snake and it really likes a lot of water, but you'll also see it on things like lawns or in gardens. Uh, and it, it loves eating frogs and fish. Uh, the one on the top left is actually a very interesting species. It's a green keelback. And uh, can you see where that yellow mark is on it, uh, on, on the neck? So again, a related species uh, is known from the Far East, is actually known to eat toads and sequester the toad's toxin. So and, and that toxin is stored in a gland called the nuchal gland, which is where that yellow uh, mark is. And when an animal attacks it, it sort of bends its head down and just shows its neck where the gland is for the animal to bite there. And the, the, they use the toad's toxin to actually make themselves more, uh, um, well, uh, yeah, more distasteful. And uh, so animals that bite them will, will sort of froth, just how they would when they, if they bit a toad. No one has actually recorded this with this green keelback, but the green keelback is also an almost exclusive toad specialist. Um, and I have seen that behavior of it doing the uh, 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 the head tilt with the, when, and showing its neck, but we don't know if the nuchal gland still works. So that still has to be tested, uh, but they do have a nuchal gland there. The one on the top right is a striped keelback. Um, again, another harmless snake to us. All these are venomous, but harmless to us. Um, and striped keelbacks used to be very, very common. I mean, when I was in school in Bangalore, I found them on Museum Road. Um, uh, in fact, I didn't find green keelbacks on Museum Road, um, where all the walk, the well, when the pavements weren't paved and there was grass on them, we'd find a lot of these snakes there. Um, and the bottom right, uh, beautiful little jewel is a hill keelback. It's a juvenile hill keelback from the Western Ghats. Now, these are the constrictors that we find in the main constrictors that we find in uh, uh, in Bangalore, around Bangalore and in Karnataka. 
Um, but even things like the, the, the rat snake and all will sometimes constrict their prey to kill them. Um, the one on the left is the Indian rock python. Uh, and although there are rumors and, and legends of them growing to 40 feet and all, no snake has grown that big uh, ever. Um, uh, well, at least not in, during human history. Um, the, the Indian rock python grows to about 14 or 15 feet. A 16 foot Indian rock python would be really, really massive. Um, the myths that you hear about them falling on you from trees or uh, wrapping around you and breaking your bones or swallowing you and breaking your bones by wrapping around a tree are all false. Um, they are ambush predators and they do constrict, but what they do is each time the prey exhales, they sort of tighten their grip. And eventually there's no room for the prey to inhale anymore. So the snake actually is able to suffocate its prey. There's some research recently that shows that the sudden pressure also puts a lot of uh, um, pressure on the heart and the heart could also fail because of that sudden constriction. The one on the top right is a common sand boa. Uh, again, it used to be very common in the outskirts of Bangalore, uh, Hesargata regions, uh, the Nelamangla area and stuff like that. Um, not so common anymore, I guess, because of all the development. The one on the bottom right uh, that looks like a dog has left it, it's marked there, uh, is the, it's called the red sand boa. Um, people believe that it's, it's got two heads and it uses one head for six months and then it uses the other head and goes in the other direction for the other six months. Uh, the funny part is uh, I would like to meet the person who followed this snake for six months. Uh, no, one's, no one's ever done that. Uh, sadly, it's also believed to make you rich. Um, so you'll find snake charmers and other uh, fraudsters actually trying to sell this thing for lakhs of rupees, saying that you'll make crores of rupees. But I've always wondered why no one asks them, if it's going to make me so rich, why doesn't it make you just as rich and why don't you keep it? So, but no one's ever, for some reason, asked that question. The sad, the, the terrible thing that's happening right now is that they're sold by weight. So uh, uh, friends of mine who are in the anti-illegal wildlife uh, uh, sector or space have told me about how they found things like ball bearings uh, that have been force fed into the, the snake uh, and then the mouth has been uh, sewn shut. So just to make it heavier and things like that, it's, uh, it's very cruel. And this poor, absolutely harmless snake, it's a snake that just will never bite. Um, you can, if you see one of them, you can pick it up and it'll just keep trying to move away, but it won't bite. Um, and this snake is having uh, having a really hard time because of these beliefs. Now, this is probably how most people you know, or, and some of you who are here would react to snakes. Um, and unfortunately, snakes are really, really terrifying to, to most people. And that comes from, if you think about it, uh, very early in the day, when when people didn't know much about things like germs or even poisons or any of the or, or venoms at least where you have when so when an elephant kills someone you can it's very obvious how that person died uh, or if someone you know uh, died from uh, in a battle it was very obvious but you have a tiny little animal like you know just a foot foot and a half long and it gives you the smallest of scratches and then the person dies the immediate the, where everyone's mind would probably have gone to is, oh, this must be a supernatural animal. And hence, everything about that animal must be supernatural, including the remedies. And unfortunately, that's what stuck, especially so in India and parts of Africa for the longest time. Um, changing that mindset is very, very difficult. But snakes are like any other animal, like your dog, cat, tiger, elephant, dolphin. They're animals and and as such, they have certain needs and certain stimuli. So it's quite, it's, it's actually quite obvious how to work with them. And because of this, unfortunately, because of this, uh, of these myths and, and ignorance, a lot of people have jumped in and really are milking this for its, uh, for all that it's worth. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of people in rural India who come up with all kinds of 
um, you know, roots to uh, to some other animal part to all kinds of things about you know how to either keep snakes away or cure snake bite. The picture on the left is actually a much more recent uh, addition. Unfortunately, this this was um, there was a company that brought this in and was selling it as a way to actually ward off snakes. Now, these uh, these pest repellents are very common in many places. What this company did is it put it onto a walking stick, and uh, and and basically the whole theory is that a farmer can walk with this and then put it in the ground and continue his work. The thing is, the frequency that this thing emits, the snakes cannot even hear, let alone be bothered by. Uh, even, even the other animals like rats and cockroaches and all that are meant to be uh, repelled by this uh, frequency, it doesn't work with them either because animals get used to those sounds. Um, so it's actually something that just does not work at all. And you would ask, yeah, but so what? They're just selling something. The, the best weapon or the best tool that anyone can have to not get bitten by a snake is to be vigilant. When you rely on something like this, that guard is let down. And that's when accidents happen. It's sort of like crossing a road without looking. So it's really important to not rely on all the other things, but focus really on simply checking where you're walking and what you're doing. Another thing, unfortunately, that's become more of a menace than, than good. In fact, even though most, most snake rescuers do this, uh, rescue snakes with the best of intentions, uh, the whole practice of catching a snake and releasing it somewhere actually results in the snake's death. So we're not, we're not succeeding at even saving that individual snake. But what we're also succeeding at doing is affecting another ecosystem that is otherwise balanced. So it's really important to try not to move snakes as much as possible. We can take them out of the situation. So if there's a snake in your house, for example, in your home, take it and release it outside. And you might say, oh, but what if it comes back? But if you think about it, you don't see snakes in your home every day. That's, that's, that's an exception, right? It's an aberrant. It's not something that happens all the time. So let the snake out and then just be a little more careful about keeping your door shut or those kind of things. Uh, it's much, much easier, especially in, in urban settings to avoid any such conflict. So now some, I'm just gonna show you some videos uh, that were made by my mentor. Oops, why is it not playing? There you go. So you can see that's a cobra. Uh, very often a cobra will do this false strike. It sort of slaps rather than actually bites. Uh, they do bite as well. And it, you shouldn't rely on the, the cobra first slapping before biting. But very often a cobra will actually just do that fake uh, strike. They will also very often bite and not inject any venom. They're called dry bites. So uh, snakes really don't want to bite us, which is the good news. If they did want to bite us, none of us would be able to handle snakes. And we wouldn't have over 1.3 billion people in India. So it's, uh, the, it's to their credit that they just want to stay out of trouble. This is a Russell's Viper. And this has actually happened to me a fair few times uh, when we've been tracking our snakes that we, re we radio uh, track a few Russell's Vipers and I've been very close to them on, on, on a few occasions. Um, and the snakes just want to just hide. They don't want to bite or anything. And this is one where a snake actually flees, the Russell's Viper again. We just actually finished a study when we approached Russell's Vipers and we tried to ask, uh, ascertain which one, you know, what made them stay and hide or, or flee or hiss. Um, interestingly, a lot of it was just basically uh, individual choice. Um, the, the same ones would often just move away. Uh, the same one, the others would just hide. Um, but we only did it for about two months. So we have to do a lot more research before we can actually come up with something very solid. And this is a, a very fortunate person 
who steps on a Russell's Viper and the Russell's Viper strikes, but it misses and then it takes off. So you can see that the snake strikes and then after that, it's not like, okay, you stepped on me, I have to bite you. It's only thing is I need to escape. And this is something that happens about 10 lakh times in our country every year, uh, where people end up getting bitten by, by snakes. So even here, you can see how reactionary the snake is. It's not like, it's not sort of taking the fight to the leg. It's, it's just being defensive. But that's a snake that wants to bite. And you can see how focused it is. I'll play it again for you. Uh, don't blink. Here you go. You see it strikes at the, at, at the, the mouse and it squeezes its venom into the mouse because Venom is fundamentally evolved to allow an animal without hands and feet to be able to subdue prey and subdue it quickly so that the snake doesn't have to chase it. Now, there's some really terrible statistics to share. We have, uh, uh, just before I go on, uh, Rashmi, am I doing okay for time? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, sure. All right. So, so India loses about 60,000 people every year to venomous snake bite. Um, globally, we uh, lose about a, a maximum of about 140,000 people a year. So India accounts for almost a half, uh, sometimes more than half, depending on the year, uh, of the number of people dying to snake bite. But in addition to that, there's also about 2 lakh people who suffer what's called, uh, 200,000 people who suffer what's called a permanent loss of life function or morbidity. It could be tissue damage, it could be the loss of a limb, it could be kidney failure. So it's, it's really, it's, it's, a huge, uh, it's a huge cost just from the point of view of life and limb. If you add that to you know, the fact that very often it's breadwinners in a very poor strata, economically poor strata of society. The economic impact is also massive. Um, the, uh, we've done a little bit of work in Nigeria and in um, Sri Lanka on the psychological aspects of snake bite uh, survivors as well. And they found that there's a very high level of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorders in and depression in uh, snake bite uh, survivors. So it's not it's not, if you combine all the other human wildlife conflict together, property, um, loss of life, um, damage to person, all these things put together, it doesn't even hold a fraction of what snake bite is. The good news is that snake bite can actually be tackled. So it's uh, we know wh why it's happening, we know where it's happening, and we know ways of avoiding it. So it's a very akin to learning how to drive. And, you know, when new highways come up in rural areas, initially there's a lot of, you know, things going wrong, wrong accidents happening, but people learn. With snakes, we also have to learn. And the problem is with snakes in a rural landscape, it's not like you can say, okay, fine, now I need to check for a snake because it's not like crossing a road. There could be a snake anywhere. It could be in their house. It could be in the fuse box when they're going to turn the pump on. It could be while they're walking to their field, while they're working in the field, in the roof in the, in, uh, of their house, in the school, in their scooter, anywhere. So they just have to check. But the, the thing is, it's something that you have to do all the time. Now, this, this is true universally. If we keep our surroundings clean, and when I say clean, I don't mean just, you know, pretty, I mean, actually clean. So you don't want to have piles of things. If you have a waste, uh, a garbage area, make sure that it's clean regularly. So even the smell doesn't attract rats. Um, 
make sure that when you have your garbage out, it's not accessible to rats. Uh, all these things will cut down the number of snakes tremendously. You have to always be vigilant. Um, in, in gated communities that have garden spaces, uh, play areas for kids, it's really important to have that area nice and open. There shouldn't be thick hedges. Uh, speak with the children about it. You know, tell them that if a ball goes into a bush, use a stick. In fact, leave a couple of sticks there so that kids get used to doing those things. And that's what actually makes things much, much safer. And now in case of snake bite, uh, there's a few things that you should do and some things that you should absolutely not do. The only things that you should do when if someone's bitten by a snake is first take charge of the situation and be calm and reassure the patient. Tell them that you'll deal with everything and then go ahead and start removing anything that might become tight if swelling were to happen. So bangles, rings, watches, friendship bands, uh, if the person is wearing long sleeve, uh, long sleeve shirt, unbutton the cuffs. So just to, to not, not constrict anything. And then you immobilize the limb. And you can do that with a sari, a dupatta, a towel. So if it's in the hand, you sort of make a sling like you would for a broken hand. And that's it. Uh, don't, don't put anything tight around the hand. If it's on the foot or the leg, the best thing to do is to carry the person. If you can't carry the person, give them your shoulder. Uh, and your, you should be on the bitten leg side. So they can keep that leg up and slowly get to a vehicle and then get to hospital. If you see any symptoms along the way, uh, if pain is increasing, if swelling is increasing, if you see uh, discoloration, if the eyes start drooping a lot, if the person starts slurring, you can just make quick note of those uh, uh, symptoms along, uh, along with when it happened and give a very brief report to the doctor. Uh, it doesn't matter if the person got bitten on his way to watch the, the new Spider-Man film. It matters what time it was and um, and what's happened since. So just a brief thing to the doctor and then they'll take it on. Treating snake bite if the person is taken to a hospital promptly is actually not difficult at all. So that's the key thing, the right first aid and going to the hospital. But more important than what you do is some things that you should absolutely not do. Now, I know that most of us have grown up being told that you need to tie something tight to not allow the flow of uh, venom. The problem is this makes things much, much harder. Um, it, so if you, for example, if you tie a, a tourniquet or, or a ligature of some sort that, that is constricting the flow of blood, it's, it's constricting the flow of blood to the heart. It's not constricting the flow of blood from the heart. So the heart is still pumping. And what that does is create a lot more pressure. Now, to treat the venom, you have to actually remove that ligature. You can't, because the antivenom is fed intravenously. And when you do that, the sudden gush of blood will lead to what's called a, something, what's, to something called rapid onset of systemic env envenomation. It's sort of like um, sort of like a sucker punch of venom rather than just it going quite easily. Uh, if we're all adults here, it's sort of like uh, it's sort of like a tequila shot of of venom as opposed to a beer of venom. So you want to stick with the beer and not something hard. Uh, don't panic because two things happen, your blood rate, uh, your heart rate increases and you make bad decisions. Uh, do not cut or suck the wound at all. It's uh, for one thing, if you cut the wound, what you'll be doing is releasing the venom straight into the bloodstream. You cannot suck out the venom. So don't even try. Trying to suck out the venom will actually uh, probably burst smaller capillaries and let uh, the venom into the bloodstream. But if you think about it, if you put a, a, a drop of ink into a glass of water, you can't suck the ink out, right? So, and that's a, that's a physical reaction of diffusion. Venom is binding at a molecular level to your cells. So you cannot actually suck the venom out. Um, so it's best not to even try. Don't wash the wound. Infection is not an issue. And any antibiotics that the doctors will give you when you're in hospital will deal with that. Washing will also involve massaging, which also will spread the, the, the venom more. Uh, don't give or take any medication. And if, even though you might feel like a drink, don't have alcohol, coffee or tea or any stimulant, no Coke or anything with caffeine in it. Uh, if the person is thirsty, you can give them water, but tell, make sure you tell them to, to take small sips so that they don't choke on it. 
And of course, don't go to any alternate healers. None of those things work. They only make matters worse. So this is some of the work that we're doing actually. Uh, it's, it's just, it's basically some of the work that we're doing uh, about snake bite. So we do a lot of epidemiological surveys looking at who's getting bitten over, over time, what they were doing, those kinds of things. Uh, prevention is much better than any than cure. And we're trying uh, to create a model for uh, cutting down snake bites to almost zero within one district. Um, and then we do venom research and anti-venom research as well. This is some of the work with the communities that, that we, uh, that we, where we live that we're doing. And that, uh, although it looks like chewing gum, is, uh, is a reconstruction of a venom molecule. You can see how complex it is. Um, it's not something that is easily understood. Uh, but right now, there's some very smart people doing some very uh, interesting work. And hopefully, we'll have better cures to venomous snake bites in a short while. This is something that we found. This was one of the first projects that we worked on. Um, and we published this about four years ago, I think, four or five years ago. Um, but we found that a lot of other species that are medically significant that the antivenom doesn't work on uh, or works to a lower degree. This was looking at the species that the antivenom is supposed to work on. And if you look at the, the antivenom vials, there's a dotted line. Um, if the color reaches the dotted line, means that it's working to, to an okay degree or to the degree that it's meant to. If it doesn't, it means that it's not. And this is again one of our earlier uh, uh, projects. So uh, you see that in Punjab, it's, it's really not working at all. Um, uh, and in, in, Bath, in West Bengal, it's not working against the cobra. Uh, there's a bunch of places where it really isn't working at all. And this is a Russell's Viper study that we're doing at the moment. Uh, we've sort of wound it up for a few months, but we'll restart again um, in, in, by October, I think. Um, so the premise of it was that, you know, we needed to also get the snake side of the story and understand what's happening to be able to come up with informed ways of avoiding snake bite. And this is the area with which, within which we actually did the work. It's, uh, it's where I live. It's a patchwork of lakes, canals, fields, plantations, really pretty picturesque area, but it's filled with a lot of Russell's vipers. And you can, so you can see on the left, that's an ideal place for a Russell's viper. There's a paddy field in the background. There's a lake after that. There's these coconut fronds. There's a pile of it. So it's a great, great real estate, uh, home delivery, and nothing else is really required. Everything is there. And because of that, there's a lot of conflict. Um, this picture, although it's really gross, uh, and it might make a lot of us queasy, is, is one of the lesser, uh, the, the less triggering pictures, um, because it gets much worse. And of course, Russell's vipers are getting killed on site as well. So what we did is we told people around the community saying that if they found a Russell's viper in their uh, field, we'd come and collect it. And when we did, we'd speak to them about the, whether they'd be okay with us putting a transmitter in it and releasing it back into their fields. And a few people, to their credit, actually uh, allowed us to do this. It was, uh, I mean, this is a species that they're truly terrified of, and they allowed us to do this. And it's been thanks to them that we're even able to do the, the research that we've done so far. So what we do is we implant it. So the, the uh, transmitter needs to be surgically implanted. And uh, uh, it goes into what's called the salomic cavity. We have it as well. It's what's inside our ribs, basically. Um, and we put it about 75% of the, uh, the snout vent length down the body where there are no uh, vital organs or anything. And none of our snakes over three years seem to have a problem with it. And we were able to find snakes again and again, which is what we need to do. To be, say that Russell's vipers do something, we need to have, we need to be able to find the same Russell's viper and have many of those as well. So we need to be able to say, all these Russell's vipers showed this, this pattern of behavior. Otherwise, the only thing we can say is that, you know, we saw a Russell's viper doing this. So we found, uh, we know, we now have a very solid idea of their home ranges. 
uh, there's their breeding cycles, uh, when they birth, uh, what they eat, the kind of places that they really like, uh, microhabitat choices. And it's helped us a lot to be able to um, inform the agricultural community there about what they need to do or not do. And so every day our team would head out, track all, uh, at one time we had 31 snakes out in, uh, in the fields. Um, so it's a lot of work, um, but we'd get data from them about, uh, um, you know, where they were hiding, whether they'd moved. Uh, sometimes we'd see that they've eaten or not. Uh, we were able, because we were able to follow them, we were able to collect uh, their poop and see what they'd eaten. Um, and most importantly, we, we found when they were active and where they moved to and the kind of microhabitats that they truly prefer. So just cutting down those things where people are will cut down risk. And we, we also, um, so we, towards the end of the project, we started measuring risk, looking at you know whether there was a higher chance or a lower chance of the snake and a person actually meeting. Uh, this is, I just wanted to share a irritating beep because this is what we hear all day. It's the receiver uh, and the transmitter is actually giving out that signal. And that's all. That's my daughter from 13 years ago letting a snake out of our house. So, uh, sure. Um, we, I guess we can move to questions and I see it's gotten quite dark here. One second. Yes, thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, I think uh, we'll move on to the question and answer session. Uh, please uh, feel free to post your questions in the chat box or you can even raise your hand. I see Shreya Petula raise her hand. Uh, Subodh, can you please take over uh, and moderate? Sure, sure, Sanjay. Uh, thanks, Sanjay. Uh, uh, Shreya, if like, you'd like to go first and ask your question, please unmute yourself. Hi, I'm Shreya and I'm a fourth year student at Ashoka University. Um, the question I kind of have is not very, so I have two questions and like one is a little bit like less important because the first question I had was that um, I wanted to know if like most snakes go only for live prey over like dead prey because they mostly sense vibrations more, but at the same time they can also smell. So is there like a preference that they have like, because I know spiders go for live prey only. So like do snakes also have a certain preference like that? So most often snakes will eat uh, live prey only. Uh, there are a few reports. Uh, uh, in fact, one of the king cobras that was tracked at Agumbe uh, ate a cat snake that had been almost flattened on, on the road. Um, and okay. uh, I actually watched a, a spectacle cobra eat a roadkill Russell's viper as well. Uh, so they do sometimes scavenge, but it's not active scavenging. Uh, I think it's opportunistic. Uh, but then again, there's not very much work done on, on snakes per se. And your second and my question? second question is actually related to anti venom. And like, I wanted to know if, like, is it like the availability of anti venom in local hospitals like that are closer to rural areas? Like, is it good? Like, are they actually able to find anti venom when they go to their nearest, like, hospital? And like, is it like different snakes? Like, they obviously probably require different anti venom. So, like, I don't yeah. know, like I'm very confused. So like, what's the situation with when I'm in like, South India specifically? Like, so in South India, like, actually, I'm in Karakura, good. and I can see like, Okay. okay. Cool. So two things on that thing. Uh, first, you don't need a different antivenom for different snakes. In India, we only have what's called a polyvalent antivenom serum. And that works for the big four. Uh, uh, so the, it works for the Russell's viper, the spectacle cobra, the Sosco viper, and the crate. And in South India, it works better than it does in most other places because most of the venom for the production of this anti-venom comes from uh, Chennai, uh, the uh, Snake Catchers Tribal Society. So, uh, um, so that's one thing. You don't need a different uh, anti-venom. Hospitals stocking it. Yeah. So uh, many hospitals do stock it. Um, uh, in fact, most government hospitals are supposed to have it. It's not always there. But it's the kind of thing that you don't want to wait until you need it to know where to go. So what would be good is if you live on Kanakura Road, for example, 
would be to call hospitals that you can get to within an hour to an hour and a half and find out if they do have antivenom and if they have their protocols in place for uh, treating a venomous snake bite. And, and then you choose the best of those options. And you, you should combine it with one that is easy to get to and uh, one that has a good rec track record uh, in the emergency room. Uh, thank you, Shreya. We move on to uh, Karthik. Yeah, hi. Uh, so, Jerry, this is actually our classmate from school. Hi, Karthik. I was and looking I, at you, yeah. <laughs> and I just thought, my, I've got my twin boys he used to come to your farm a lot. So, I thought I'd <laughs> yeah, listen in for this. A quick oh. question. You know, I feel like the... Um, uh, especially to kind of, in, given the number of deaths is so high in India every year, uh, I really think you guys need a, a Bollywood film, you know, with a kind of a snake-centered topic with a top actor. I feel that could kind of give a whole set of people who are not, you know, who are, uh, because I've seen that educational film out of the Madras uh, Society. I mean, your, uh, yeah, your Krog guru. Krog Krog yeah, I've seen a few of those. And they're really well, you know, done. And I, some, you know, I've got some other, some of my folks here who live in Orissa who work for me, you know, see it. And they really changed their way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So I was just thinking, has that ever come across your desk of, you know, some kind of a, 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 a movie, a, a, you know, it could be a fictional movie, but with a lot of kind of strict set of stuff that has been built into it. It would be very good. And I think someone else should do it. Yes. <laughs> so, um, our hands are actually pretty full with uh, the on-ground grassroots level stuff. Uh, but yeah, so this, and, and it is something we struggle with, with getting the word out. Uh, but I don't think, uh, well, I'm certainly not built for it. And uh, um, I don't think I know many people who are actually built for No, no, you could be more of an advisor, but I think a script getting some, you know, maybe getting uh, some good, you know, well-known film folks for a script into this would make a, I mean, if, it, if they know the difference it could make, it could be, I mean, it's like 50,000, I think. Yeah, I'm not sure Bollywood uh, would be that concerned, but uh, it's worth a shot. I, uh, do you know anyone? Yeah. yeah, I'll come back to you on that. I, I've got a couple of folks mm. I can run it by. Okay. Sure, sure. Uh, would anybody else like to ask any question? You can either type it out or you can raise your hand. Yes, Mr. Bharat. Yeah, uh, my question was, uh, actually, I have some land near Hassan, uh, agricultural land. So sometimes uh, we walk through tall grass. So is it uh, safer to wear uh, tall uh, rubber boots or something or jeans or, or so on, you know, basically to ex at least cover your uh, legs up to the knees? Does it help? In terms so of jeans, jeans won't work. At, I mean, I mean, they provide a very minuscule amount of protection. Uh, gum boots would help. But ideally, if you can avoid walking through tall grass, uh, that's the best thing. And if you must, uh, I would suggest keep definitely wear the gumboots, but also maybe carry a stick in uh, and just disturb the, the area in front of you where you are walking. So that will make things a little, uh, a little safer. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have a question in the chat box uh, from Mr. Mohan. Uh, Jerry, can you read it or would you like me to read yeah, it out for you? I can read it. So uh, when we catch a snake, how far can we leave that away without making it change its habitat? I have a koi fish pond and the keelback is a regular and they eat up small fish like mollies and guppies, sometimes even baby koi. Yeah, that's part of their home delivery service. Uh, um, unfortunately, there's not much you can do if you move the snake uh, too far. It, it will probably die if you move it, if you don't move it far enough, it'll keep coming back. What you could look at is the design of your, uh, of your pond. And if, for example, if there is a lip, so if this, is, if this were the ground, uh, and then there's a sort of lip like this going, it'll be a little harder for the snake to actually get into it. Um, and that, that, that's something that maybe you could look at. Um, but yeah, fish and koi especially are very easy for them to catch as well. Uh, Rajiv? Yeah, hi. Hi, Ginjari. Hey, Rajiv. 
Jiri, so uh, you know there are quite a few aquariums and you know pet shops where they've been selling you know quite a lot of snakes these days. Mm. Especially there's one uh, which is called Karnataka Aquarium. I was surprised to see a video of theirs, where you okay. had a variety of you know ball pythons and you know black colored you know snake and you know some colorful mm. snakes. I mean, he yeah. claims to you know he claims to be you know he says it's legal, but I'm not sure if it's legal and you know uh, does the government have any say in it? The government does, and so. It is it is technically legal, uh, but the truth is he's probably smuggled them in. Uh, so what's happening now is there's been this sudden surge in in a craze to keep snakes, and uh, and the government uh, so the Indian Wildlife Protection Act doesn't have anything that uh, targets exotic species species that don't exist in the country, um, and because of that, people have always been able to smuggle stuff in. Once it's in the country, it's it's not there's there's no jurisdiction uh, of anything that can actually tackle it. Uh, about two years ago, um, the government put out a sort of an amnesty where you, they, it said if you've got these animals, declare them, and uh, and then and register them. The issue with that is that registration process is still open, so people are still bringing in a lot of stuff, and it's just getting regularized. So it's it's a big 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 problem. And I think what I'm very worried about is also there have been a couple of seizures where people have uh, where they've seized um, venomous snakes uh, at, at at Chennai I know of and I think in Bombay as well. And the problem with this is most most people who just collect and keep these snakes as as well pets quote unquote uh, don't do it very well. So if the snake were to die, that's bad, but it's not it's not the end of the world. If the snake were to escape. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it would just be very, very problematic. We have a large enough snake bite problem anyway. But even if non-venomous snakes were to escape, they would probably do very well in our climate. Most of them would. And that, that would cause a massive invasive um, species problem, uh, especially since these are all, all snakes are predators. It, it could really, really damage uh, our ecology and ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And Jerry, would you you know, speak a little about your farm. I heard quite a lot about it. I mean, quite a little, I would say. <laughs> um, are you talking about the farm on Sajapur Road? Uh, it says the, you know, Martin Farm. Okay. So that's actually, so I set it up about 20 years ago. Uh, okay. For my parents and they've run it since. I don't have anything to do with it. Um, oh, okay, okay. I actually live near Nagarhole um, on a farm there. It's called the Liana Forest Farm. And... Uh, uh, but as is, so we're actually reforesting the place and we focus a lot on community uh, and wildlife uh, conservation. So the Martin farm is my parents and my sister, in fact, used to run it uh, up until okay. COVID hit and then I think they've closed it down. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Sure, sure. Uh, does anyone else have any more questions? Uh, well, Martin, I, uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, people talk about this, uh, you know, especially when we were kids, um, they used to say that there are some plants which are snake snake repellent plants. If you plant yes. it around your house, you will not, uh, like, for example, the marigold is also said to be one of mm. the snake repellent plants. Yeah. Does that really work or is it just... A not, not, not a single one. They, they, they talk about some plants that attract snakes and some plants that... Uh, uh, that repel snakes, none of them actually work. Um, so I've, you'll see snakes in marigold fields. There's one, one plant called the mother-in-law's tongue. And uh, I think the mother-in-law's tongue can repel a lot of other things, but not snakes. Okay. Then uh, it's also equally true that the bamboos don't attract snakes then. They don't necessarily attract snakes, but bamboo can be a very good habitat for snakes, snakes especially because the leaf litter falls into the uh, the center of the clump. Uh, so it can be good habitat, but it's not like it's attracting snakes there. Uh, the, the plant itself isn't, it's the kind of space. Anyone else? Any more questions? Yes, Mr. Narsimhan Kanak. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, I have a mortal fear of snakes. And uh, one of the reasons why I didn't join this 
Zoom session uh, initially was because <laughs> I cannot even see or uh, watch snakes. So, um, can I, uh, do, you, do you have any advice to, for people who can who have this huge, huge fear of snakes? I've actually worked with a few people who have, your sounds like a, a full-blown phobia. Um, and it's probably because of something you either heard or saw or experienced when you were very young. Um, the um, one thing that you could do is to start reading about them. Uh, but look at um, look at actual uh, books that are not fictional. Um, so if you start reading, um, there is a book called um, the, the uh, Field Guide to Indian Snakes. Um, I can send, uh, I mean, Gitanjali probably knows about it as well. It's written by Romulus Whittaker and Ashok Captain. You can start reading that because fact really helps a lot. And they've got some beautiful pictures and images in there that you can keep looking at as well. And, and that the important for one, unless the phobia is crippling you in any way, there's no need for you to really rush it. It's always good to get over a phobia, but there's no need to rush it at, at all. So uh, what I would suggest is just start with really small baby steps. Uh, and if you, if, if I can help in any way, then you can certainly come over to our place. And uh, I've worked with a few people um, at their own pace and, and that might help you as well. But I would just suggest take it slowly. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'll try and do all these things. Can you sure. put Put the, uh, can you send the name of this book on chat? Or... I'll, just, I'll just put it in the chat, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Meanwhile, I think uh, Leela has a question. So good. Leela is raising yeah. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Just a minute. Just a minute, Leela. You're, you're, you're muted. No. Wait, I yeah. sent it to a single person. Sorry, I don't know why that happened. Yeah. Special uh, thanks to Sanjay and special thanks to Jerry because just now I heard somebody said phobia, but I definitely feared. I didn't have any kind of phobia, but uh, uh, today I happened to see the whole series very interestingly and then I'd never seen a snake uh, biting or even uh, I never thought of something just, you know, it, uh, is it a mock kind of thing? I mean, how the elephants mock? That kind of is that the word, uh, Jerry? I yeah, think, sometimes uh, it is. Yes, it's it's a mock. Right. It does not bite. I was not aware yeah. of that. So yeah. that's something brilliant. All those things I saw, and then the other thing is, we always thought that two, whatever you word use the word combat, uh, or majority of us think two snakes are mating. Yes. We never thought there is a combat. Uh, two mate is the next step. We always yeah. thought the mating is what is happening. Is what the majority of us thought. And then the other thing is, uh, yeah, and uh, wherever they're prone to snake bites, is it good their homes have the antivenom kept in their homes? Is it a good advice I'm asking you? Uh, actually, that's very, it's, it's not a very good thing to do for two reasons. Uh, no one should ever decide to administer the antivenom on their own because that can be very dangerous. Well, at least uh -huh. take it to the hospital, carrying it, you know, just like, you know, just keep it safe. So the problem, with, the problem with storing antivenom at the off chance of someone getting bitten uh, is, is that it creates a shortage in the market. And the people who really need um, antivenom are, are agricultural farmers uh, who basically need uh, to, to have that antivenom at a, uh, a government hospital. So creating shortages in the market is actually a really not a good thing to do at all. It's important, like I, uh, I mentioned to Shreya earlier, to find out which hospitals store it uh, and stock it. Um, and it, and you know, a simple 30 minutes of making a few phone calls to hospitals around you uh, will actually give you that uh, thing to have. And it's also much easier to do that than to, to go out and find antivenom and keep it. Uh, you're muted. I also got to know today that there's one single antivenom for all kinds of snakes. Well, for these four at the moment, uh, we have to include other species into it as well. So okay. it's it's going to be it's it's going to be another three to five years before we have a really well, hopefully, awesome antivenom that works very well 
across the country, or at least specific to the regions of the country. So uh, there's a lot of research and deliberation that's happening at the moment. Okay. And you also thought that uh, the king cobra of Agumbe is the deadliest snake in the world or whatever is what I thought till today. It's they're actually very, very nice, well-mannered snakes, king cobras. They don't bite anyone. They only bite... So, of recently, there have been a couple of deaths, but they're usually rescuers. And um, it's very sad to lose rescuers, but unfortunately, both these rescuers were intoxicated when they were handling uh, the snakes. One was not, but uh, but the way they handle it is very rough and everything. And recently, a, a, a zookeeper in Trivandrum also died from a king cobra bite. So that's one of the reasons we're actually uh, we're pushing a couple of the antivenom producers to make one batch every three years of um, king cobra antivenom that can at least be stocked in zoos in different parts of the country because a lot of zoos have uh, have king cobras. Oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks so very much. Thank you. My, you're welcome. My pleasure. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, move on to uh, Sridhar. You can unmute and ask a question. I request anybody who is asking questions to please also turn on their videos. Hi, Jerry. Uh, Sridhar here. Hi, Sridhar. Uh, hi. Uh, in fact, it's really very nice to, um, to know about the snake and the way you have uh, really uh, uh, told us within... Uh, I mean, I know it's a very short span of time. One and a half hour is nothing uh, to know more about... Uh, I mean, a uh, lot about the snakes. Uh, first of all, I have two questions. One is, what is the time in case if there is a king cobra bite and uh, or uh, any spectacle cobra or the common for what you have told, the result viper and uh, the other snakes, uh, what is the time lapse that we can uh, actually have uh, till we reach the hospital? That's first question. I'll, I'll ask you the other question later. Okay. So, um, the... The king cobra is very different in that the, the fastest recorded bite was something like 24 minutes. But that was a, a description that uh, a, that someone had given uh, during an interview. So it wasn't actually uh, recorded by any doctor. Uh, but generally, if you have, um, if you get to hospital in a couple of hours, you're almost certainly fine. Um, venom takes some time. It's really important to also follow the the the... Um, the protocol and the first aid uh, carefully and get to hospital calmly. So, and if you're in a city then, uh, or a town or, you know, even in most places now, you'll get to some hospital or the other within a couple of hours. So you don't have to worry about it at all. Fine. Uh... Yes, uh, just one second. I also wanted to add before, Sridhar, your second question. Uh, I think on Amazon, the book is, costs a kidney. It's pretty expensive. Uh, but um, if if you just get my number from Gitanjali, uh, we have copies stocked. Rom, Rom actually uh, lives at our place. And he's got copies and he's selling them for 1,500 rupees uh, for the hardbound copies. So um, uh, if you uh, if you want, I, I can just, just send me a message and I'll coordinate it from there. So, yeah, thank you. I was just going to mention that it's Hi. quite. Yeah, on Amazon, it's become very dear. Uh, uh, and I think the ones that you get from Roma also signed. Yeah. So, if that yeah. matters to anyone. So, thank you. Sorry, sorry, Sridhar. Yes. Okay, no, no, no problem. My uh, second question is in case if somebody wants to learn more about, about the snakes and all, uh, if they have to reach out to you, come with you, I mean, pray, I mean understand. Uh, do you have a batches you do in, or uh, do you also invite individuals to join you? So uh, a, a bit of both, Sridhar. Uh, I do run uh, workshops. Uh, sorry, but... sorry to interfere, uh, Jerry. I, in fact, I also wanted to ask you if you can have one session for uh, you know our group members, whoever is interested. How many sure. uh, people can you accommodate at a time? And uh, you know. Uh, okay. So shall we actually look at that? We can uh, we can uh, maybe look at this offline and figure out uh, when and how and all. Like I was telling Gitanjali as well. Right now, it's very. I mean, the rains are pretty heavy, so we won't be able to do much. 
uh, I can just email uh, you guys some possibilities. Uh, and it depends on what level of of understanding and knowledge and all you want to you get, get from it. So uh, personally, if it's just, I feel that if it's you know just getting an experience of snakes and understanding some doubts, uh, seeing some of the work, then you know just an overnight would be more than enough. Uh, but if it's a full on workshop, um, I basically um, I run a four night five day workshop which is called the science of snakes, which is a very intensive one that also includes uh, how to safely work with venomous snakes that have come into your property and things like that. So, uh, but, so that's a, that's a four night and five day thing, which will probably only be able to happen after the, the monsoons. But we'll, we'll well, talk about that. Yeah. So. Well, Jiri, uh, that's about the four nights and uh, I mean, uh, five days workshop. Uh, my part of, uh, part of the question was, will you do for individuals or only batches and as you rightly said i mean post monsoon so i just yes. want to understand all this so Something i can give you volunteers do come over and spend time uh but the thing is that it, so it can't just be so at that, that time i can't focus much time on the, their learning uh but they get to learn by assisting the researchers and and people who work at uh, at our uh, setup as well um, but the, the workshops are what I do, which is really focused on people learning and building skills. So that way I can just dedicate that time to it. Fantastic. And uh, uh, as you said, it's only post-monsoon if you have to do those workshops, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, because right now it'll just, I mean, it'll, uh, the rains will cut into uh, any time that we have. And that will just mean a less of an experience and less learning. So after the heavy monsoons, we can we can figure it out. Fantastic. Sure. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, thanks for the information. And also please share your location also in the chat box so that it will be nice for us. Okay. I don't know how to do that <laughs> in the chat box, but uh, um, I think Gitanjali has shared uh, your number. Uh, yes. So I yeah, think see that you can get in touch with uh, Jerry and uh, take the location. Yeah. And Bharat yeah, I think there is one about anti-venom, uh, whether it needs to be refrigerated. So you get two kinds of anti-venom. You get the liquid uh, anti-venom, which does need refrigeration. And you get the dry or lyophilized anti-venom, which is vacuum dried. Um, and that can stay in just, you know, room temperature. Uh, for And the, usually the shelf life is three years. There's one more question in the chat box. Uh, 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 I think it's from Karthik. Uh, I saw a video which said snakes kill other snakes, alike humans. Is it true? Well, uh, it's not necessarily alike humans. Uh, snakes will kill other snakes if they were going to eat them. Uh, so King Cobra, for example, eats all, feeds almost exclusively on other snakes. Uh, so yes, it will kill other snakes to eat them. Uh, crates and some other species do as well. Uh, unlike humans, uh, snakes will not get into a fight with another snake for no reason. Uh, so um, yeah, they, they they have purpose to it. So All right, thank you. Anybody else with any other questions? I guess we're done. I think I, I'm Ayman. Yes, Ayman has a question. Ayman, yes, Ayman, go ahead. Unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for the session. It was extremely informative. Um, so I recently got into the world of macro photography and we had gone to Chikmagalur and we, I saw a cat snake. That was my first snake that I saw in the wild. Nice. So I just wanted to know if uh, there are certain practices that you'd like us to follow while trying to photograph snakes. Actually, that's a very good question. I mean, I've actually seen a lot of photographs of them, uh, coming out of late where people are doing a, a few things. One, they're destroying habitat. So if you are, for example, turning over a log or a rock, it's very important to not just turn the log or rock back, but to make sure it sort of fits into exactly this, the 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 sitting space that it was in because that forms a seal under it. Uh, and if that seal is destroyed or 
what happens is that that habitat isn't uh, viable for them anymore and it'll take many years for it to happen again. Secondly, it, I found that with, with, uh, with photographing um, snakes specifically and of course frogs and things like that as well, we restrain them for a long, long time. And that's something that is adding a lot of stress to the animal. So, uh, but I've also seen people do it very well where they, they plan everything, they take a few pictures and then when the animal is out there, they take four or five shots and that's it. So in fact, the problem is nowadays everyone has a digital camera. Um, so, you know, they, they'll just click away because it doesn't matter at all. They can just take as many pictures if they, as they want and, and sort it out later. But when, when we started taking photographs, when I got my first camera, it was a film camera. And then it was transparency slides. So one, the film was very expensive. And two, developing it was, was just as expensive. So uh, we were a lot more careful. So, but we should also look at it from the animal standpoint. And if you think about it, this animal, especially things like, you know, people want a cobra with its head hood spread out, right? That's not a picture of a cobra. That's a picture of a traumatized cobra. Okay, so or a, a vine snake with its mouth agape and it's open, it looks very spectacular and sensational, but that's not a picture of a vine snake. That's a picture of a traumatized, terrified vine snake. So um, there are also people who take in situ pictures of snakes where it's tremendously challenging because snakes are so elusive, but they take some amazing pictures without troubling the animal at all. And that is where skill really lies, where you can actually, you will actually pretty much have to blend into the surroundings to be able to take a picture of that. And the level of stealth that you need is, is, is phenomenal. And that I feel is something to aspire to, uh, uh, to be able to just watch. So, and one of course is the, is the whole thing of photography, but try and also experience stuff, not through the lens, because what you'll be getting from it is very different. Uh, and that's where the greatest learning is. Uh, the best teachers, um, for you know how to deal with animals are the animals themselves and unfortunately when we put a phone or a lens between us and the animal we don't get as much of the texture um, and I'm not talking about just visual texture I'm talking about the, the behavioral dynamic of how what we're doing is affecting the animal uh, is something that you'll get by watching them slowly and uh, and allowing them to be natural. Thank you for that question as well as the answer. Uh, it was very informative. Anybody else with any questions? Okay, I think. Uh, I think we're done, think, uh, Sanjay. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Thanks, uh, Subodh. Um, thank you, uh, Leela. You want to ask something? I see you raising your hand quickly. Yeah. Uh, no, okay. All right. Uh, so at the outset, uh, our, uh, uh, sincere thanks to uh, Jerry for accepting our invitation. And thank you, Geeta Jali, for, uh, you know, uh, connecting us uh, to Jerry and uh, making him come and speak. It was a wonderful session, I will tell you. It's probably one of the uh, best sessions I have attended on uh, um, not merely snakes, but any any other kind of wildlife. Uh, thank thank you. you so much. And uh, we will definitely connect with you and see how uh, we can uh, learn more uh, from you. And uh, of course, uh, about relocation of snakes, uh, what you said is absolutely right. I think uh, we should, we will be uh, by uh, leaving them in some other place, we will be uh, really uh, causing a damage to the ecosystem. Uh, that is something, yeah, it's not only hazardous to the snake, but also, uh, you know, uh, it's 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 uh, not safe for that ecosystem all, as well. Thank you. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, Geetanjali and Footsteps in the Wild for uh, providing us a link for this uh, session. And uh, Subodh, thank you for moderating. And uh, last but not the least, all the participants who have been here, 
and uh, our asked questions who have taken part and you know, for the information of those who have uh, come for the first time uh, i would like to say that we meet on fifth day of every month on this very uh, uh, platform uh, zoom and uh, we will have uh, sessions on various subjects uh, so please do uh, join us and uh, we have a website rashmi uh, has shared it www rotary wildlife uh, rotary fellowship for wildlife dot org uh, please do visit and uh, uh, thank you for being there thanks again jerry thank you so much my pleasure good night everyone take care yeah good day thank you thank you uh, thanks thank you thank you yes